to this debate uh, between Michael Albert and the Surgeon Pipe Dragon. Uh, before I actually do the introductions properly, let me we'll do some little bit of housekeeping. Um, if you need to lose the news for those, the ladies are doing their studies for the gents who go out to turn left and they just up some stairs. They're well signposted. Um, as far as I know, we're not expecting any fire and fire drills this evening, so if the alarms go off, uh, everything the fire exit is well marked. You can turn out into the corridor left or right. If you have mobile phones, if you wouldn't mind checking them to make sure that they're switched off. And um, we'll, uh, we're going to have a, we're going to, the format of today is going to be um, that uh, the speakers are going to each have 20 minutes. Uh, then they're going to have another 10 minutes, and then we'll open them to the floor. Um, <coughs> I'll ask for questions first, and then at a certain point, I'll open it up to uh, comments or contributions from the floor. Then, if the speakers wish, then I'll have a five minutes just to finish off. We'll be finishing promptly at quarter to ten. We have to vacate for the ten o'clock. Okay, um, Paracon or a world without money? Which way to a class of society? Uh, we have two speakers for you tonight, both of whom share a broad perspective in that they both reject capitalism and look forward to a future post capitalist society. The issue then is what form of society will we expect is sustainable uh, beyond capitalism? Uh, on my right, I've got uh, Michael and Albert, who is uh, a founder member of Z Communications and the author of Paracon, Life Beyond Capitalism. So Michael will be talking about Paracon. On my right, um, on my left, rather, um, I have, we have Adam Ewing. Adam is a member of the Socialist Party of Great Britain and will be putting the party's case for a stateless, classless and moneyless society. Okay, um, I've got some announcements, but I think we'll leave those for the next few minutes. Okay, um, as described, well, first, thank you for inviting me and having the session. Uh, and I think it's raining outside, so thank you for coming. Um, <clears throat> participatory economics, I think, is a, is a name for a system meant to be an alternative to capitalism, and also an alternative to uh, market socialism, centrally planned socialism, what has sometimes been called 20th century socialism and so on. Um, I can't do the whole thing in 20 minutes, so I'll do some key elements, and maybe that'll be relevant to the discussion, I hope. Um, as you described, we want a classless economy, meaning we want an economy where the economic institutions do not, by virtue of participating in them and, and functioning in the institutions, divide us into opposed constituencies, opposed classes, where they have different interests and where, in particular, one dominates one or more others. Uh, so that's, we want classlessness, okay? Uh, obviously, one step toward classlessness is you can't have 2% who own everything and who have a piece of paper in their pocket and by virtue of it, are rich and powerful and so on, and everybody here agrees, so don't waste any time with that. You have to get rid of that. Um, that, however, is not sufficient, at least in my view. We are getting rid of what we can call a monopoly on productive property, because that monopoly on productive property, the fact that the 2% own the productive property, gives them a position in the economy, which gives them a set of interests, behavior patterns, that gives them power and wealth and divide society and causes them to be at odds with those below, a ruling class. We get rid of that. Having gotten rid of that, we hope, what we have left is participants in the economy, each of whom, by virtue of their situation, is a comparable situation to others in the economy, and therefore, it's a classless dynamic in which people can participate in decision making and people can have fair and just reward and so on. But there's a problem. <laughs> There's a, another way in which economic organization yields a class division. And this second dynamic, um, which exists in capitalism, but becomes paramount once you get rid of the, the private ownership, is that an economy can be organized 
so that jobs have a particular characteristic. We can call it a corporate division of labor. So that a subset of people, and actually it's almost always just about 20% in an industrialized society, have empowering work. That subset does empowered work. And the, that means that the tasks that they're doing in their work conveys to those people skills and knowledge and confidence, um, the kinds of attributes that are quite useful to preparing proposals, discussing and debating proposals, making decisions, pulling the levers of power. So that set of people I want to call the coordinator class. And I want to say it's different from the remaining 80% who I want to call the working class. The working class is a set of people who does disempowering labor overwhelmingly. They do work that basically stultifies and deadens, that leaves one exhausted, feeling beaten, and, and less able to participate in decisions because one doesn't have information, one doesn't have confidence in social skills, one is instead just plain exhausted. The other layer, the 20%, comes out of the workday, so to speak, over and over and over again, accumulating knowledge of the workplace, skills that are associated with interaction and decision making, it tends to dominate. So, <clears throat> the, the contention is that you can get rid of the owning class and still have a class division. And indeed, still have a ruling class. A set of people, it's not because of a political bureaucracy. Of course, a political bureaucracy might exist. Hell, a dictator might exist. That's another realm. Inside the economy, by virtue of the division of labor in the workplace, 20% are elevated in their situation as respect to 80%. And they accumulate greater wealth and greater power by virtue of the extra of the situation that they have. So the question is what to do about this. Now, there are lots of questions one can ask about economy, and I'm sort of focusing on this one for the moment. What to do about this? Well, now we get to participatory economics. So participatory economics says, first of all, we should have workers and consumers councils. So far, no problem, I assume. Um, workers and consumers should be making the decisions, the economic decisions. Again, I think no problem. I wouldn't, I, I noticed the chart up here which says democratic control. Um, it's not that I disagree, I mean, it's a small disagreement, but maybe of some consequence. Imagine this is a workplace. Democratic control tends to mean to mean, maybe you mean something different by it, one person, one vote for everybody. Okay, if this little group of three is a little work team, in fact, we're not going to have one person, one vote about how they should apportion the work among the three of them, right? And we're certainly not going to have one person, one vote among everybody about whether or not he puts a picture of his wife on the left side or the right side of his desk. He's going to make that decision like Stalin, unilateral. Nobody gets a say. And that's because it affects only him. And their decision may affect only them as long as it's taken in context of the overall decisions that we've made. So the idea is self-management. We should have a say in decisions in proportion to the degree that we're affected by them. That's just a little richer way of saying what I suspect the word democracy up there really means to people. Um, nobody really thinks that the, everything should be one person, one vote, majority rule. Some things yes, some things no. Why some things yes and some things no? Because some things, that's the road to self-management. Other things, there are different algorithms that make sense to, to yield self-management. People having a say in decisions in proportion to the degree they're affected. Okay, so so far, very kind, it's not very complicated. So far we have workers and consumers councils. We have self-managed decision making, which means sometimes democratic majority rules, sometimes consensus, sometimes one person makes a decision when it's just affecting them, and so on. Two things done. If this is a workplace and we do that in this group, but we keep the old division of labor, and that means that the people in the first three rows over here are doing empowering work and the rest of us are doing rote and repetitive work. And we're exhausted each day and beaten by our work and they are understanding more and more about the workplace. And they are getting more and more confident by virtue of what they're doing. And in time, I contend, what will happen, and we've seen it over and over again, is that this set of people will, by virtue of its position, dominate decisions. In fact, the rest of us will begin to stop going to the workers' council, because it's just boring and alienating to sit there and listen to them talk. So we will begin to drift away, like in elections, perfectly good reasons, 
and they will be left to make decisions. And some of the decisions that they will make, for instance, is to change the income distribution, which had been made equitable, because we believe in that, workers and consumers councils, and equitable income distribution, which I'll come to in a second, they will get rid of that and they will start paying themselves more. They will give themselves more income. So we have to solve that problem. Now what is equitable income before we get to the solving this class problem? Well, I would say that it's this. It can't be um, that you get income by virtue of a piece of paper in your pocket, a deed to property. Uh, that's not moral and it is not economically sound. So we get rid of that, which is why we got rid of private ownership. Done. It can't be that you get more income because you are powerful enough to take it, right? Bargaining power. That's a market, market principle, right? Al Capone believes in you get what you can take, and so does the Oxford Business School. Bargaining power is the norm for remuneration associated with markets, in fact. But we don't believe in that. We don't want a thug's economy. We don't want it to, you know, if you're more powerful, you get more if you're less. So that's out. Many socialists say you should get an income. You should get a share. What is an income? It's a share of the social product. That's what it is, right? There's no, it, it's not dollar bills. It's a claim on the social product. So your income entitles you to a certain share of the social product. And uh, many socialists, in fact, will say, well, what should happen is if I produce this much value, I should get back an income proportional to this. And if I produce way more, I get more. If I produce less, I get less. OK, I don't like that. I'm not gonna, we don't have a lot of time. Why don't I like that? Well, it means Michael Jordan was underpaid, not overpaid. Because the value of his product was enormous in terms of how much people like watching Michael Jordan play basketball. Or what's his name? Ben is like Beckham. Right? Um, I had to remember. So, uh, Beckham was underpaid. You know, the owners got the piece of it. The, the, the sneaker companies got a piece of it. But why should people get paid that way? Well, they shouldn't. What that does is it rewards if you have better tools. It rewards if you happen to be producing something more valuable than somebody else who's producing something worthy and worthwhile but less value. It rewards if you happen to, to have a genetic endowment which gives you a lot of productive capacity. If I'm born with Frank Sinatra's voice, why on top of that should I be showered with wealth? Right? I am going to contribute something to society. People like hearing me if I have his voice. Or I have Michael Jordan's reflexes or Beckham's feet or whatever it is. So the point is there's no need to shower such a person with wealth. We shouldn't reward product. So we rule that out. So what is left? Well, I would say we should remunerate, that's a technical term for it, we should remunerate for how long you work, for how hard you work, and for how onerous the conditions of your work are. So if I want more of the social product, right, I work longer, or I work harder, or I work under worse conditions. Now, actually, I don't really choose all those things freely because I work in a workplace and there's certain things available, but I certainly could work longer or less long. Okay, so if that's equitable remuneration, and in our workplace we have our balanced job count, we have our uh, worker self-management, and now we have equitable remuneration, but we have these three rows doing all the empowering work. After a while, the rest of us begin to get frustrated and alienated and to disappear from decision making, and they decide to change the distribution of income. Because as it stands, all the people who are working on the assembly line and at the furnaces are earning the same amount as the people who are the chief financial officers and the accountants. And they decide they don't like that. They decide, we're better. We're smarter. We're worthy. We, it all depends on our responsibility. And so they pay themselves more. And what happens is all the old crap comes back. That's the way it's typically said. And this does happen. So in co-ops it happens. In occupied factories in Argentina it happens. If the old division of labor is maintained, the economy, not some political apparatus elsewhere, the economy breeds by the implications for what people are doing, this class division and the coordinator class rule. Okay, so now suppose, okay, we're sophisticated enough to deal with that. We're gonna try and fix it. 
So what we do is we take all those empowering tasks and we divide them among everybody. And so we have a workplace in which each person is doing a mix of tasks suitable for the person. You don't have to do something that isn't you. A mix of tasks suitable for the person in which each of us is doing a mix that's comparably empowering to the mix other people are doing. So when we all come to the workers' uh, council and we're making decisions, it isn't the case that most of us don't know anything about the workplace and 20% know everything about the workplace. Rather, it's the case that we all are comparably empowered. We all have comparable, you know, roughly comparable confidence and social skills and some knowledge of the workplace and so on and so forth. Okay, suppose we do that. So that's very nice. But now if we have a market or we have central planning, we have to engage with other, with other workplaces. And those two allocation institutions, again, we don't have enough time. I don't know how much time I've got left. Oh, really? I'm moving along. Okay, so um, we have to engage with other, uh, with other um, workplaces and with consumers. And if we do that with markets, we know something. With markets, it's competitive, right? And what happens, let's imagine we're a bicycle plant. So we build bicycles. But, but we're in control now. It's our plant. Right? So what do we decide? We decide to have daycare. We decide to have, we decide to clean the plant up. It's no longer be, going to be the case that we all have to wade through gases and, and the heat and we have air conditioning. And we stop junk, drop, dropping the, the, uh, the, the, the waste into the neighborhood. In other words, we make decisions that make work more pleasant because that's a reasonable thing to do. Our lives matter too. It isn't just the people who consume our product that matter. We matter too. So we make those decisions. But the bicycle plant down the road in a market system decides not to make those decisions. They decide to function the way it would function if it was owned by money bags, by a capitalist, basically. And they are able to, as a result, spend less on cleaning up pollution, spend less on improving the quality of life for the worker in the workplace, demand far more intensity and duration, and pay it less, Right? And with the extra surplus that they have, they can advertise, and they may even improve the bicycle. And the point, at least until we're out of business, and the point is they will outcompete us for market share. And as they do that, what will happen is that our glorious worker self-managed, equitable remuneration, balanced job complex workplace, and exemplary place that we love will be great except for one thing we'll all be out of work because they will have outcompeted us and they will have taken the market share away. So you can't do it with markets. And you can't do it with central planning because that's just downright authoritarian and it violates self-management. And I suspect people here would probably agree on that, so I'm not going to spend time on it unless it comes up later. The crucial thing is markets. OK, so what do we do? Well, first of all, why do we have to do anything? That is to say, why do we have to have something to replace markets? And central planning. Why do we have to have allocation as a, as a thing that we have to actually pay attention to and accomplish? Well, there are a lot of reasons, but let me just give you one. Um, the, the products of workplaces require inputs. They partly require labor, of course. They partly require some resources that get used. They may require intermediate goods, all sorts of stuff. Electricity, the stuff in the workplace, the stuff in the product, all kinds of things. If we make more of something, suppose we make more bicycles. Suppose we make, instead of 1 million bicycles, 40 million bicycles. If we make 40 million bicycles, we're using up a lot of stuff that could have gone to something else. Now, there's a very important choice to be made here. Do we want our energies, our effort, and all the materials that are associated with making a bicycle to go to more and more and more bicycles. No, we don't. We do want some bicycles, because they're fulfilling. But it gets, there may be a point where another bicycle isn't worth as much as something else that you could do with the, with the energy and the labor and the people and the resources. And that's a very important determination, right? It's important for multiple reasons. One reason it's important is workers have to know how much of something to produce they can't just know somebody wants it. How much do they want? Right? 
versus how much other people want other things. If everybody wants bicycles, and we produce 100 million bicycles, most, and most people didn't want it very much. They didn't really want it very much, they just said they wanted it. We may well have produced way too many bicycles because we used too much of our stuff producing bicycles. Because we didn't realize that out of the 100 million who said they wanted a bicycle, 97 million of them really didn't give much of a damn. They just wanted a little bit. If it was available, sure, I'll take it, I want it. So you need a measure. You need, this is what, you need to have some sort of way of assessing the relative costs and benefits, the values, the implications of our economic choices. And that way of doing that arises through an allocation system. Now through central planners, what happens is the planners ask a bunch of questions and establish values. They, they, they pin values on things, right? And that's a mess for various reasons. We only have so much time, I'm not going to talk about that, unless people want to. But for markets, what happens is, buyers and sellers compete, right? Sell dear, buy cheap, yeah. Buy cheap, sell dear, in other words, the buyer gets ahead, the seller loses, the seller gets ahead, the buyer loses. The seller and the buyer compete, buying a car from a car producer. The person who breathes the pollution from the car isn't in the transaction. Not in the transaction, but affected, right? That's not self-management. Because what we want is that people who are affected by decisions have a say in the decision. So the first problem with markets is that, in fact, it doesn't convey influence to the people who are affected in anything like an appropriate degree. That's a serious problem. That violates self-management. But the second problem here is that it misprices everything. By misprices, I mean it establishes a measure of how much people value the thing. Not some God-ridden value in the sky someplace, but what does the population right, feel about the, the worth, the relative worth of things, of items that are going to be produced, given what goes into them? Now, with markets, it doesn't do that. What markets do is they establish prices that are exceptionally good for one thing, making the, prop, making the owner rich. Right? But they don't reflect true social costs and values. We know they don't affect ec ecological implications. Price of gasoline, what is the price of gasoline in England right now? Here you go. I don't know. Alisa. All right, if it's this, it should be this, right? Because it's not taking into account the ecological effects of the consumption of the gasoline. So it's mispriced. And even if they just mispriced that, that would mean they mispriced everything that oil is used in, and gas is used in. But they actually mispriced everything for all kinds of reasons. Right? Not least that they pay no attention to the quality of life of workers. Markets don't, don't account for that. Markets don't account for that. The price of coal does not, does not embody that coal miners get black lung disease. It's irrelevant. It, isn't, it doesn't count. Right? But it should count. If I'm deciding whether or not I want to have some coal to keep my house warm, if I'm really responsible, what that means I'm asking is, do I want a little more coal to be produced, given the difficulty and the pain and the resources and the energy and everything else that goes into getting coal in order to be a little warmer? Now, maybe yes, but maybe no. And the calculation is a calculation based on the true social and human costs and ecological costs of the engagement. Okay, an allocation system has to, has to deliver that. An allocation system has to give us that information so we can make that decision. Right? Mm. Okay. It has to give us that information so we can make that decision. So the last feature of participatory economics is called participatory planning. It's an allocation system which, and there's no reason to accept anything remotely like this based on the two seconds I'm going to now give you, in which workers and consumers councils go have a process which involves the cooperative negotiation of the relative values of inputs and outputs and how much will be done, how much will be produced and not be produced. And people's income, that is to say, their claim on the social product, right, is depends upon how long they choose to work and depending upon the allocation of jobs and everything else, how hard and how onerous the conditions are, which is virtually the opposite of that. And the claim is that this set of institutions, workers and consumers self-managed councils, equitable remuneration for duration, intensity, and onerousness, 
balanced job complexes, and participatory planning, which we haven't described in any significant detail, but I'm asking you to take on faith that it could exist, that this set of, of institutions together establishes a way of doing production and consumption, which is simultaneously classless, delivers self-managing influence, self-managing say over economic decisions to all who are involved in them and affected by them, right? produces solidarity, that is, it creates a context in which to get ahead, to do well, to succeed, to have pleasure and fulfillment, you have to be concerned about other people. That's remarkable. It's the opposite of now. Now, if you brought up and, you, and you're sort of a nice person and a caring and a sensitive person and you get plunged into the economy, you either fail or you become a schmuck. Right? Garbage rises. The economy now produces antisocial behavior. It makes us oblivious to the well-being of others. It makes us function, the market economy, right? function um, obliviously to, to others, or literally stamping on others. A paradigm creates a condition in which if you're brought up and you're a bit of a schmuck, you know, you're a greedy person, you're, you're not very nice, and you go into the economy and you're going to greedily try and make yourself better off, the only way you can do it is to be concerned about others. So it's an economy that, while it produces goods and distributes them, also produces solidarity, also produces diversity, also produces self-management, right? also produces equity, and is classless. That's the claim for this economy. And it's viable, and it's worthy, and there's nothing utopian about it. Something that I just want to say, as time goes by, if you do need to leave the room at any point, can you make sure that you use the, the doors in the back? As you see, we're, we're filming, and it does help to prevent people passing the cameras. Okay, thank you. I don't view it, so she's quite a Okay. Um, I just heard the case for retaining, buying and selling, prices, payment for work, and accounting in money in a classless post-capitalist society. I now want to put the case against this on behalf of the Socialist Party and the World Socialist Movement of which we are a part. Now, there are some key terms in this debate. One of them is class, the other is capitalism, and of course, there's socialism. So let's start with class. Now, one of the best definitions of class that I've come across is in this book by uh, James Burnham, The Managerial Revolution. I'll, I'll read that. For society to be classless would mean that within society there would be no group, with the exception perhaps of temporary delegate bodies freely elected by the community and subject always to recall, which would exercise as a group any special degree of control over access to the instruments of production and no group receiving as a group preferential treatment in distribution. So class society would be the opposite of this. It would be a society where there would be a group which would exercise a special degree of control over uh, productive resources and would or may not have also a preferential treatment in the distribution of the uh, products. Now, this special degree of control is sometimes called ownership. Now, that's all right as long as you don't understand ownership in a narrow legalistic sense to make the people of God pieces of paper saying that they are the, the owners. That's not the reality. The reality is that there is, as a matter of fact, within society, a group of people do, who do exercise this special degree of control over production, which may or may not be also backed up by the law. I mean, there's, there's a saying that Possession is nine tenths of the law. Actually, it's more accurate to put it the other way around and say that the law is merely one tenth of possession. And true that in the West generally, this special degree of control has had legal sanction. But there's a recent historical example which shows that this doesn't have to be the case. I'm talking, of course, about the former USSR, where there was a group which clearly did exercise a special degree of control over production 
but without having legal uh, property rights, uh, legal uh, entitlement in their own name. Now, when you um, think about it, if the state owns the means of production, those who control the state are going to be in a position to exercise this special degree of control over their, um, over their use. And, of course, in Russia, there was a group of people, they were the uh, top and middle ranks of the so-called Communist Party, the non Kachura, who did exercise it. They were a, a collectively owning, exploiting, and privileged class without legal property titles to, you know, to, uh, uh, to back this up. So what this means is that this special degree of control is exercised through controlling political power, either directly, as in the former USSR, or indirectly, as in the West, through a state, which is, uh, which is our elected, through a state which will enforce private property rights. Now the implications for this is that if we're going to have a classless society, we mustn't just abolish private ownership, we've got to abolish state ownership as well. The means of production need to become the common heritage of everybody. Everybody should have an equal say, at least an opportunity to have an equal say in the way that they are uh, controlled and run through various democratically uh, elected uh, councils. And the, once again, this is generally called common ownership or collective ownership. We'll talk about society and things collectively. Now, as I said again, you can interpret this as a right as long as you don't interpret it in a narrow legalistic sense, to mean, for instance, the state property. In fact, what the big concept going across is you could just as easily say that where the um, means of production become the common heritage of all, we're talking about no ownership as, 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 as much as uh, common ownership. The means of production is there to be used under various forms of democratic control. Now this, which is the, the common ownership and the democratic control of the means of production by and in the interests of the people, that is the aim of the Socialist Party. It's the definition of socialism that we accept. It's not our definition, it's not something that we've, that we've thought of ourselves. It's in fact what the word means, the word socialism means logically uh, and uh, historically. It's, it's not just shared versus, of course, it's true in, in the past there were more groups that shared this view of this, uh, socialism. But anyway, it's, it's, it's not our uh, invention as an organization. Now, I think that Michael would agree that <coughs> no ownership and democratic control have to be features of any classless uh, society. But he's, in fact, uh, chosen to, not to call it socialism, to abandon the word socialism to those we would say uh, stand for state capital. The Leninists, the Trotskyists, the, the, the Maoists, the left wing, the Labour Party, and the uh, Social Democratic Party. Now, we agree that if these people are socialists, then we're not. But we've decided to stick for historical, maybe even sentimental reasons to the word socialism and to, and to tough it up, even though we know, in fact, that this will mean we're going to have to spend quite a bit of time explaining what socialism is not going to be preferred to explain what it is. Okay, so that's socialism. What about capitalism? What is capitalism? Now, some people say that capitalism is the sort of thing that goes on uh, down the in the city of London, all over there uh, in Wall Street. Other people define capitalism as private enterprise plus free markets. Free markets in the, in the sense of markets that are free from state interference and state regulation. Actually, of course, markets have never existed free from uh, state, uh, state regulation. In fact, capitalism itself finally triumphed through the state and is, in fact, maintained by the state. So it's a myth that capitalism and the state are opposites. They, they, get, they go together. The trouble with this definition, so which incidentally, capitalism, which incidentally is shared by supporters as well as critics of capitalism, the trouble with it is this. It means that capitalism has never existed. It means capitalism never existed, except as a policy or as a policy uh, objective, ironically, to be implemented by the state. 
So capitalism is not financial wheeling and dealing. Capitalism is not private enterprise. Capitalism is not free markets. Capitalism is not private ownership. What capitalism is, it's a way of producing and distributing wealth, which has two key features. And the first one is that the actual work of producing things is done by people who are hired to do this for a wage or a salary. So capitalism is the wages system. The second key feature of capitalism is that it's not just a system of production for the market, it's a system of production for the market with a view to profits. So capitalism, if you like, is the wages system, the process of wages and profit system. Now, it's the pursuit of profits by separate units of capital, enterprises, if you like, but not just enterprises. It's this that drives the capitalist economy. But the purpose isn't to accumulate profits so that the capitalist class or the rich can lead a life of luxury. That's not even the main aim. The economic competitive forces that are unleashed under capitalism force every enterprise, if you want to stay in the race for profits, to re reinvest most of the profits in new, modern, up-to-date, productive equipment so that they can at least remain and have their costs equal to those of their rivals or if, or if not, uh, lower. So, profits have to be accumulated as more capital. In fact, that's why capitalism was originally called capitalism, because it was a system of capital uh, accumulation out of profits made by exploiting wage labor. One of these impersonal economic mechanisms isn't controlled, not even by capitalists, and in fact is uncontrollable. Because these economic forces, market forces if you like, they not only force enterprises, private enterprises to behave in this way, they force state enterprises to do it. And as the world market, they force governments and states to, which obliging them to give priority to capital uh, accumulation. So there is, in fact, such a thing as state capitalism. State capitalism is still a form of capitalism. That's why in the form, that's why in the, in the form of USSR, and, and still today in Cuba, the people in charge there have been forced by these forces to give priority to capital accumulation over the satisfying the needs uh, of, of their people have to do this so as to remain competitive on world markets and to keep up with other capitalist countries. Incidentally, I'm really anticipating, but insofar as Paracom is conceived uh, as a system which would just exist in one country, I think a, a Paracom economy, if it ever came to be, would be subject also to these same um, uh, pressures. So, state capitalism is just another institutional framework within which capitalism, you can make economic you know, mechanism of capital, as I said, is the accumulation of profit uh, <clears throat> produced by wage labor. Just another framework within it operates. So we don't abolish capitalism by replacing legal private ownership by state ownership. We don't abolish capitalism by replacing so-called free markets by state regulated markets. This just changes, as I said, the institutional framework within which capitalism operates. Now, the trouble is that if you have a definition of capitalism which doesn't take into account the existence of state capitalism, you're likely to end up with a mistaken wrong definition of what is post-capitalism. If you think, for instance, that Russia was post-capitalist and that all that was wrong with it was it wasn't democratic or didn't have workers' control or anything else, you'll, think, you'll, be, you'll tend to think that you get rid of these what you see as, as, as defects, that will be all right, and the economy will become all right, while leaving intact buying and selling and accounting in terms of money. So this, in fact, brings us to the crux of the debate this evening. Is the retention of buying and selling, remuneration for work, exchange value, prices, calculation in terms of money and, and, and the pursuit of a monetary surplus by enterprise. Are all these things compatible with a society in which the means of production will become the common heritage of all? 
And we say no. Michael says yes. And the reason why we say no is that if productive resources have become a common heritage of everybody, then so have the products, or so are the products. And in this, in this situation, the question isn't how to sell these, these products. It doesn't make sense. How can you buy something which you already own? The question that arises is how to share them out, how to distribute them. So said, socialism as a society based on common ownership is distribution economy, distribution economy, or one sort of economy, society. And it's not an exchange uh, economy. Things are not bought and sold. They are just there, taken and used in accordance with rules and procedures that are laid down by society. Now, of course, what there is to distribute will determine the actual method, the actual you know, way they are, they, they are distributed. Now, it's our contention that on a world scale, the resources, the technology, and the working skills exist to allow us to produce enough to go over to free distribution. I'm not sure actually whether distribution is the right word in this context, because it could suggest some sort of centre handing out things or, or, or doling out things, which is why we prefer to speak of um, free access, free or open access. Products would be made for people to take freely. I'll spell this out in deep, well, deep but in, in practical terms. People would get the food, clothes, and other things of everyday use which they need by going in to a distribution centre and taking it without having to hand over money or consumption vouchers or credits of any kind. Houses and flats would be rent free. Water, electricity, gas, and other utilities would be provided free. Transport, healthcare, communications, education, restaurant, laundries, and like, would be run as free public services. There'd be no admission charges to get into museums, or parks, or football grounds, or any other place for entertainment and recreation. And the term that we use to define this is the key social social relationship of socialism is free access. It is emphasizes that the choice of what people need is made by the individual. Now, it is possible that right at the uh, beginning of socialism, or even in fact into socialism, as a result of some natural disaster like a, a volcanic eruption or an earthquake, that some goods might be in temporary short uh, supply. In that case, obviously, there have to be some form of rationing. I mean, Karl Marx was discussing this question what, 130 years ago in 1875. Says, suggested that the system would be rationed by the number of hours worked, which was a popular idea at the time. Other people, also at the time, like the anarchist Kropotkin and uh, Edward Bellamy, who wrote a book of backwards, they suggested equal sharing in these circumstances. But the point is, the point is that there isn't any point speculating about a situation like this which might not arise. And even if it did arise, we can't possibly know today what the exact details are going to be. All we can say is that whatever is done in these several circumstances, it will be a temporary stopgap emergency measure to be got through quickly so that we can move on as soon as possible to free access or to be back. And that's one of the criticisms of, of Paracon. It's, it's a permanent scheme to deal with this so-called problem uh, of scarcity. But our view is then that the, the socialist method of distribution is from each according to their abilities to each according to their needs. Now, two minutes. Why do you reach socialism? <laughs> anyway, in uh, talking about consumption and distribution before production, you know, perhaps I have put the uh, cart before the horse, or perhaps in the end I haven't, because after all, what is the natural, logical aim of production but consumption? What we want is a system of production that is geared to meeting people. What we want is production for use. So how might this work? Now some people, as we mentioned, have suggested 
that there should be some sort of central plan which would lay down in detail uh, what industries should produce over, over a given period of time. Well, that might work, I suppose, but I don't see why things have to be as centralized as that. We can also envisage something like what goes on, on today, but without money and without um, com 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 competing enterprises. After all, I mean, the money links between the customer uh, and the shop, and between the shop and their suppliers, and those suppliers and their suppliers, only duplicates real links between, you know, between them when, when actual physical things pass along the line from one to the, 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 the other. Eliminate money, and these links would still exist. So, what I'm talking about is, in effect, a system of uh, stock control. And this could be more or less self regulating in accordance with the principle of free access. So, not only would individuals have free access to the things that they need in the stores, the stores would also have free access to the things they need to keep the shelves of the, of the stores. Uh, you know, full of the things that people needed. These, these, these other suppliers would have free access to the materials they needed to make these products and so on, right the way down the line until you get to the um, you know, raw materials and sources of energy. We can also envisage that this would have to be supplemented by statistical offices which would supply <coughs> figures of, 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 of likely demand for industry to take into account and plan accordingly. Now, there would be no need or prices, or money, not even as units per cap. But obviously it'd have to be calculations in a social society. But we say these calculations could be done as they are already today. today. These could be done in natural units, such, such as weight, volume, and numbers. If you have tons of steel, kilograms of electricity, and then numbers of tins of fed beans, and so on. Our view is that any system which retains buying and selling and money accounting is either a form of capitalism or some utopian economic scheme that's been dreamed up by somebody. Our view in conclusion then is this, that the only viable, classless, post-capitalist society is world socialism, which wouldn't have any need for money or money accounting, which would be based on the ducky resources of the world being, having the common property or the common heritage of everyone and being used to produce and distribute wealth in accordance with the principle from each according to their ability to each according to their needs. So, in one framework, 
um, we have capitalism and socialism. So if we get past capitalism, we've got socialism. If we don't get to socialism, we've got capitalism. So therefore, Soviet Union sucks, must be capitalism. Doesn't look quite like our capitalism, we'll call it state capitalism. But we've still got the two categories, capitalism and socialism. Basically, anything you don't like, you'll call capitalism. Why? Because it's oppressive, because it's class divided, because, and so on and so forth. Okay, you can do that. I mean, I could do that with you. Why don't I? Well, because for me, it seems to me that there's a, an important distinction between the Soviet Union, or Yugoslavia for that matter, and, say, the United States. And the distinction is, and I'm talking about the economy, there's a distinction about many other parts of society, too, that we could talk about. But about the economy, there's an important difference. On the one hand, we've gotten rid of the people who have the deed in their pocket. Capitalists, which is what everybody thought they were fighting for. I think they succeeded. I think they got rid of that private ownership. And then it said, well, the Soviet Union has state ownership. And so there's a political phenomenon that's screwing it all up. There's a, a political bureaucracy. There's a political system. It controls the economy, and thus the economy is controlled. And it sort of plays the role of capitalists. Okay, that could exist in a society. I think, in fact, it didn't really exist in the Soviet Union. But who cares? Let's leave the Soviet Union aside for a second, please. Imagine this. We make a revolution here, or in Venezuela, or wherever you like. We get rid of the capitalists. That all the people who own private property no longer own it. They're either doing a job or they ran away, or whatever way you want to imagine it. And let's say we have markets. And let's say, or we have central planning, and let's say we have the old division of labor. But we have a democratic polity. It's incredibly democratic. It is involved in local assemblies where it's one person, one vote. It's as good as Greece was. It's as good as anything anybody has in their head. Okay? So there's not a political apparatus screwing things up. But we have 20% monopolizing and powering work due to the division of labor. Now, I claim that that society is going to look to you like capitalism. To me, I think it needs a different name. Why do I think it needs a different name? Because if we call it capitalism, we'll think the only problem is capitalists, people with, who own stuff. But that isn't the only problem. Another problem, it isn't just a monopoly on property, and it isn't just being at the head of a political system, it's also having a monopoly on empowering work. So that's, I think, maybe, I don't know whether that's a place where we disagree or not, but I think it may be. If you feel that you could have world socialism or socialism or whatever maybe you want to give to the system that you like, and in that system, you can have somebody who does overwhelmingly empowering work, and indeed 20% of the population who does that, like now, and you can have other people, 80%, who do road work, and it'll be okay, because there's no owner, there's no political bureaucracy, and there's no money, I don't agree, okay? I think that other class can be a ruling class. And I think that matters, and it's confused by saying there's only capitalism and socialism. In fact, I think Marxism-Leninism, which it seems that your organization, in fact, is trying to escape, Marxism-Leninism is the ideology of the coordinator class. In Marxist terms, it's not the ideology of the working class. It sure as hell isn't putting forth the interest. It rhetorically does that, just like Bill Clinton says he's an agent of every person on the planet. Of course they do that. That's what Marx taught us. People will say that they're for everybody. But Marxism and Leninism is, in fact, it obscures the existence of the coordinator class. It denies the existence of the coordinator class. And then it poses a vision which puts the coordinator class into ruling status. So that's one of our disagreements. I'm not sure it's important. I don't know how important it is to people. There's a second major, whatever other disagreements there are, there seems to be a second one. And the second one is no money um, versus money. This is a no money, I'm money. What the hell's money? You know, if you mean capital, of course I'm not. There's no capital in participatory economics. Is there? It, values, that is, do different things have different values? Well, you're not going to get rid of that. It's, or, it's By definition, it's true. 
Some things are more valuable than other things. Anybody who thinks we're just going to get rid of that, that's just delusional. Some things have more value, they take more work, they have more resources. Two cars, more than one car. Two bicycles, more than one bicycle. A car, more than a bicycle. Although maybe we shouldn't have cars. But you see what I mean. Different things embody different levels of work and of resources and of equipment. Now why do we need to pay attention to that? Well, we don't. If it's true that we can all just take what we want because we say we need it. That we don't need to track anything. We don't need to worry about relative values. If when I say I not only want one house rent free, but I want three houses rent free in three different climate zones because I like different climates and different seasons, and I want a telescope in my backyard because I like telescopes, and I also want a swimming pool, and I also want transportation, and I just keep going. And why do I just keep going? Because there's no reason to stop. There's no reason to stop. Now, I don't believe any of you believe that. I think you all think, wait, there is a reason to stop. It's irresponsible. How do I know where it's irresponsible? How do I know when I'm going to the common area and taking stuff that I've taken too much? Right? How do I know that? How do I know that I haven't taken too little? I'm trying to be responsible. I'm a socialist man. So I go to the common area and I just take a little bit. Maybe I took too little. I didn't take what is, what's warranted. How do I know? That's the first problem with not tracking the relative values, the relative, the, the social costs and benefits, the ecological costs and benefits of the stuff we produce. That's the first problem. Here's the second problem. We're a workplace, right? There's a demand for bicycles, but it's hard for us to produce bicycles. It takes time, it takes work. There's a price to be paid for that. Do we want to produce bicycles just for a whim? Do we want to produce bicycles for people to use them as lawn decorations? I don't. Right? Nowadays, when you sell books, there's a bestseller list. Do you know what the bestseller? A book publisher doesn't give a damn if you read the book. All they want to do is sell the book. They don't care if you read it. If you can sell 14 million copies of Stephen Hawking's book and nobody reads one of them, fantastic. But in a good economy, if I'm doing work, I don't want to just get everybody to buy this stuff. I want it to be valuable to people or else I don't want to produce it. Because producing it uses resources and uses time and uses energy. So I have to know, we all have to know, in fact, what the real value of things are. If there's no, okay, okay, if there's no, if there's no valuation, there's no way to know, I have no way to know how much is too much or too little. In the world that we live in, to say that, that, that we're, the way we're going to do allocation is that we're not going to bother looking at exchange rates. We're not going to bother looking at the relative values, the implications of things for the ecology and for the humans producing them and for everything else. We don't have to do that because there's plenty. There's enough. We can produce and everybody can have what they want to take. Is to me, you, it's beyond utopia. It really is. It's, not, it's, it's out of touch with reality. I don't understand how you can say it. So I'm looking forward to your explaining it to me, because you probably will, and then I'll understand it. Um, wages. Let me just get that one last point in. Wages seem to upset you. Um, and I understand that. Me too. Wage slavery. I give my life to trying to overthrow it. But the idea that somebody has a claim on the social product, that's different from getting paid wages for selling your, yourself, your ability to do work. Not the same thing. Right? Just not the same thing. And having a, a price for a bicycle is not the same thing as having capitalist money. It's really just providing a mechanism by which people can make responsible decisions. We as workers have to decide, do we want to produce that much? To know that, we have to know, well, how much benefit does it bring to people? Does it bring enough benefit to warrant using the resources? Does it bring enough benefit to warrant working that number of hours? And consumers should also want to know, do I really want those extra bicycles? Or is it a frivolous request? Because the cost of producing them for the people doing it and in using up materials that could be used for something else, 
it's just not justified by the amount I wanted. I don't want it enough to justify it. You see what I'm saying? That's what allocation is really about. And that's all that participatory planning is about. And when you said that there would be rules and procedures, I suspect what you mean by rules and procedures, if we got down to nitty gritty, is going to be participatory planning. There's no center, there's no top, there's no political bureaucracy deciding anything, there's no ruling class. There are workers and consumers in a cooperative negotiation, except it isn't just words, it's spelled out and how it would work and why it would work and why it would get things accurate. Why it would, in fact, generate correct assessments of how much people want stuff and how much workers want to do stuff. And it, with that information, people freely self-manage the choice about what they're going to consume and about what they're going to produce and how much they're going to work and so on. Uh, I suspect our hearts are in the same place, but I do think our heads are in slightly different places, and I'm not entirely sure why. Second part of your talk, where you put the, your finger on what the difference between us is, but let me first deal with one misunderstanding that goes out of the first part. You said we were Marxist Leninists. No, oh, I said you weren't. Hmm? I said you weren't. You weren't? Yeah. Oh, good. Well, we're not, so I can. Good, yeah, so I got it right. <laughs> so we're not Marxist Leninists. You might be prepared to describe ourselves with Marxism, but not. No, I said you're not. Not as Leninists. But on this question of Russia, I'm not going to get sidetracked into that because that's. You know, that's not the main issue as to who was the ruling class in Russia. We say it's the group that controlled the state, not the, not the group that was in the, in the factory. So we wouldn't accept this three class division of society, which happens to, to coincide with capitalist class, middle class, and working class. You want the middle class to clean the toilets, and things like that. I think you're a bit of a, work, a, bit of a work list. But let's get back to the main point of disagreement. We say, say that Russia, for instance, was capitalist, not because we didn't like the political regime there, because we could see it still had the same basic economic system as here. It still had people working for wages. It still had buying and selling. It still had enterprises trying to make a, uh, a profit. Now, what Michael is, is suggesting as the ideal economy is one way it would be like in Russia, except these things will be decided democratically by the workers. But, the other thing that our, our case is, is based on is this. It's, we're not, no longer living in the age of scarcity. We can produce, as I said, enough food, clothing, and shelter to adequately feed every single human being on the planet. And even, even more, that is technically possible. Technically possible, because what's holding you back is the fact that there is a, a small group within society which owns and controls the, uh, the use of the means of production, and then we've got this economic mechanism that is capitalism, which is production for profit and the accumulation of uh, uh, capital. All that talk at the end from uh, from Michael, we need to have relative prices, we need to do this and that. It's it's based on the assumption that there is scarcity, that we have to make choices between <coughs> you do that, you can't do that, and then in fact it's the it's conventional economics. It's conventional economics teaches that what e economics is all about is allocating <coughs> scarce resources amongst competing ends. In fact, you know, conventionally, e economics says infinite and in infinite wants, so they, they, they don't rule. But that's not quite what Michael is saying. He is saying, I think, I mean, uh, that people are, you get the point, they're lazier than they're greedier. So, in other words, that, that people might work under his system, but they wouldn't produce enough to satisfy what people want. So therefore, they have to be forced to work by, what is it, wages system in the end. In the end, they have to, you have to have rationing of people, because if you didn't ration them, they wouldn't work and not enough would be produced. Now, we reject that utterly. In fact, um, one of the objections that you raised, and I was talking in Hyde Park early on in my, in my life, and that's an objection we get at every time. What if I want five houses? What if I want three Lamborghinis or, or something like that? I mean, well, it's not going to happen, is it? It's, 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 it's a, it's a knee-jerk reaction of supporters of capitalism once they hear socialism mentioned for the first time. 
But of course, we don't accept this basic of capitalist e e economics, which says that there are not enough resources to satisfy people's needs. We say there are enough resources to satisfy people's needs. And if you, if you do this, well, you don't need all these relative prices, exchange values, and, 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 and so on. In fact, what I think um, Michael's scheme is, it's, it's a sort of attempt to you know, uh, manage the distribution of value uh, in a sort of moral way based on, on principles of, of equity uh, and justice. It's, it's, it's a, I don't know, I hesitate to call it a scheme of capital, I don't think it would work. It's, it's a utopian scheme which, which wouldn't work. Incidentally, he hasn't got into all that um, detail as to how it works. I mean, I wouldn't call it a joke, but it's got some very um, nasty features. And one of them is this, that at the beginning of the year, everybody has to put in a form saying what they want to consume in the rest of the year. And that goes to a neighborhood council, which looks at what you want and can tell you you mustn't have too much alcohol, you mustn't have too much this, you mustn't have too much that. That's, you know, that ever, ever, all your neighbors will know what your consumption is going to be. Another feature, which in fact reminds me of, uh, of capitalism, is that he's not proposing remuneration just according to um, work done. It's distribution according to how hard you work. And who decides how hard you work? At the beginning of the year, you have to fill in the form saying what your, how hard you're going to work during the year. And it's judged by your fellow workers. I mean, incidentally, this is the reason why I took early retirement, because the place I was working at, they just introduced a system like this, where I put in at the beginning of the year how much work I was going to do. But the uh, decision as to how hard I worked was going to be made by the, by the manager, not by my fellow workers. But can you imagine a situation where your fellow workers can point to you and say, you're not working hard enough, and so on? It would be, it'd be, it'd be hellish. It wouldn't, wouldn't be any improvement of what we've got today. In fact, it would be worse than capitalism. And the third feature about the paracom economy is this, that enterprises are still going to be required to make a monetary service. There's going to have to, he calls it benefit cost ratio, cost benefit ratio, which means that they have to have more value uh, created than they uh, consume. That's all right. It's another name for profit. But what happens if one particular enterprise isn't up to scratch, isn't making Sufficient profit isn't making the decided benefit cost ratio. Well, two things can happen. They can be told, like individual worker, you've got to work harder, or the, the factory closes down. So that you've got in this system, this ideal system, you've got the same pressures operating on people to work harder, the same you know, pressure operating as you do under under capitalism. Now, our description of this would be, well, we, we came across these theories in the 1960s and 1970s when the word self-management first came in, into vogue. We used to describe it as self-exploitation, where workers are managing their own exploitation. They're, 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 they're forcing themselves to work hard to, uh, to, to produce profit. It doesn't matter whether, in fact, there is a, any privileged class getting a, a privileged property income. I mean, that's, that's irrelevant. I mean, incidentally, I don't think that a system like that could work without there being a class of people to force on other people to do it. So basically my conclusion, our conclusion regarding Paracom is it's a, it's a utopian scheme, or dystopian scheme, depending on your point of view, which is not going to work. I mean, we don't have to take this sort of anyway. This is a throwback to the 19th century. We had Robert Owen, Fourier, and, and people like this, all drawing up ideal schemes of how they want society to, to, to run on the basis of Eternal principles of equity and justice. But I mean, that's, that's, well, okay, we're having, having a discussion on it, on it tonight because Michael's coming here to, to describe it. But I mean, the, in the end, the only choice is, despite what he says, between capitalism in various forms and socialism, by socialism, the means of society where the means of production would be owned in common, would become the common heritage of all, we would produce things for use. As I say, if you've got common ownership, the, of the productive resources, you've got common ownership of the products. And in that situation, the, si the question that arises is not how to sell them, not how to put a price on them, but how to distribute them. And as I said again, that what, we, well, anyway, what we say is that the socialist principle of distribution is from each according to his ability. 
mobility to each according to his or her needs. That is the basic socialist proposition. And we say that that is technically possible, it has been possible, technically possible for quite a time. The only thing that stands in, in the way is that people accept capitalism. This could come into being just as soon as a majority of people you know, want it, and that's in fact what we're trying to bring about. A lively debate there. Um, we're going to give the speakers a um, few minutes to uh, just sort of get to the end of the, of the second half. In the meantime, um, just a few announcements and to the chair. Um, and if you want one or other of the speakers to respond, um, please say which one you would like. Um, there's a lot of us here. We don't have a huge amount of time, so we would ask you to keep the questions brief. And I would ask the speakers to keep the reply to you as well. Um, at a certain point, then, I'll open it up to comments and discussion. Again, please go to the chair. Um, uh, I may allow a little bit of uh, cross discussion if everybody speaks one at a time. And I think it's useful for the whole meeting. But mostly, it should just come through, through me. Uh, so we've got one hand in there already. Um, just a direct response to uh, is it David, the guy from the Socialist Party. Um, I think he kind of just missed a, a crucial issue, what Michael was talking about. Um, and it, it might seem quite an obvious thing, maybe we've missed it, but how do you stop this um, kind of indefinite consumption uh, take it, each person being free to take what they want with no kind of restriction on that. Um, it just seems like you are kind of avoiding a concrete truth that there are finite resources on a finite planet. So I mean, can you spell out exactly how you, you would say that people do that? Because, and I think we all agree that there are enough resources for everyone's needs, but I think you do need to make a distinction between what people's needs are and what people's consumption patterns are and at the moment we're we're consuming beyond the way the way we can afford to so I mean I think okay well I'm just asked so can you explain how you would stop that over consumption I mean, simply well I mean you we the socialist party me Adam Beer we're not going to stop anybody doing anything but this all comes down to if you like a conception of human nature and human Behavior. If you think that people want to live or they're somehow born greedy, then of course socialism won't work. But I mean, if you look at there are various things even under capitalism that are freely made at the, at the time of use. Um, there's free transport in uh, some places. I've got, a, I've got a freedom card. I can, I can travel freely all over London on the uh, uh, on the buses and, and, uh, and the trains. And there's also examples of. Uh, have free water uh, at a drinking fountain. Now, how do people react under these circumstances? Now, I've got this freedom pass. I could, I could go round and round and round on the circle around it if I wanted to. But why don't I? I just use this free transport pass to go from A to B. And similarly, with uh, you know, drinking fountains and, uh, and so on. People, what are people, you see people coming out there with you know, bottles and filling them and taking them away? No, they just drink and then they. Uh, Think what did, and then they go away. Similarly, in, in some parts of North America, I don't know whether it's the case in Boston, but they have local, free local telephone calls. Are people on on the phone all the time, or do they just use the phone you know, when they in, in when they want to and need to? We say that the, that the actual experience of circumstance, even under capitalism, where there is free access to things, people don't you know abuse it. And in fact. They might. I mean, if suddenly things were, de would, would, were declared free tomorrow, obviously there, 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 there would be chaos because people couldn't be assured that there'd always, these things would, would always be there and always be replaced. But if you have a, a socialist system of society where you can always be assured that the stores will be stocked with the things that you need, you're only going to take what you actually need. So as I say, that this is human behavior. This is, you know, that, if you've got this conception of, of, of human nature, that people are greedy. I don't know what you have. I think, I think, I think you might have actually, but we'll, 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 we'll find out later in the discussion. 
Um, it's been suggested to me that we take a few questions at a time and then ask the, uh, the speakers to, uh, to reply, which I think is probably a good idea given that we actually have time constraints. So um, we'll do that and then we'll, um, we'll, uh, we'll ask the speakers each in turn to respond to the uh, points that have been made. Okay, next question, please. Uh, could Michael tell us the difference between a worker and a consumer? Because there seems to be, according to his statement, uh, uh, different species of humanity. Um, yeah, just regarding the uh, scarcity debate that seems to be going on, I think that um, people could agree that there are some things that um, can be produced sustainably, such as food, right? And then there are some other things that I think we can all agree that are finite, like oil, which if we were producing those things and everybody could take as much as they need, people still wouldn't have as much as they need. If everyone, I don't think people would think that um, Western consumption of oil, for example, like someone living here using a normal, like um, an amount of oil that they use here, if everybody wanted that, and I don't think we'd call that necessarily greedy, it's just not possible for everyone in the third world, for example, to use that much oil. So um, on, on the socialist side, um, how do you, how do you uh, respond to that? And on the Paracon side, do you have some sort of um, way of making things that are sustainable over the long term, such as food, available to everyone regardless of how much they work? Any other questions? Um, in either system, is there a benefit to meriting levels of want over need? Um, in, you know, if both systems were to allow you kind of hard goods like computers, cars, large things, um, yours apparently freely, um, where's the progress in these systems going to come from when people aren't going to have to replace them? Mm -hmm. I'd like to know uh, what your approach is to education of children. And, um, well, actually, the whole of society, but how we get information that's um, reliable and appropriate through to our society and how we get it to move so that we then act um, with and we're empowered by that position. Okay. Well, I think you're Okay. Um, I really do have to say that in, in the second round, a lot of views were attributed to me that simply aren't my views. Um, and I'm not going to respond to that. I will if people ask about it. Um, uh, it's not greedy to want a violin if you like to play the violin. In fact, it's not greedy to want a Stradivarius if you like to play the violin. That's not greedy. That's, I like that. It's nice. It's good. It works better, right? And so everybody who plays a violin would like to have a Stradivarius. If, in fact, producing a Stradivarius was like producing a toothbrush, everybody who plays the violin would have a Stradivarius, right? It's not greedy if the cost of a house is the same as the cost of a toothbrush to want two or three of them in different climate zones. You don't take more water because you'd throw up if you took more water. You don't drive around the city because you'd be wasting your time if you drive around the city. Certain things, it's true. Medicine. You don't take extra medicine because you'd be dead if you took it. So it should be free. <laughs> but there are other things that it's not a matter of greed. It's if you don't know what's greedy and what isn't. See, I don't think you're hearing that. If you don't know what's greedy and what isn't, because there's no way to know how much is greedy. I'm not greedy. I don't want to be greedy. So I have to police myself in this system. And I don't know how to police myself, because I don't have anything that lets me know what's appropriate. And it's the same thing on the worker's side. It's not greedy for workers to want to not produce stuff that is harmful, is painful to produce, and it's valuable to people. So you want to produce it up to a point, but you don't want to produce it frivolously. You don't want to do that painful work if it isn't really need, desired. So you want to know, it, it's important how much people want it. And if you just need to want it a little bit to get it, that's a mistake. The idea that there's enough, well, I don't even, I just, you know, um, worker and consumer, no, not different species, different roles for the same people. You know, except for some people who can't work because they're disabled or something. 
Okay, but and they get a full allotment and their medical care, obviously. Um, but in our role as workers, we're producing. In our role as consumers, we're consuming. In each role, we should be responsible. That means we should be making choices that are consistent with human well-being and development. We don't want to choose things that give us more than is warranted by responsible norms. But to do that, we have to have some valuations. Um, so that's, that's the workers and consumers. Um, free goods. Oh, could it be things made free in Perry Of course. Of course. Why not? In other words, you can have a Perry and you can have the subway free, and you can have water free, and you can have shoes free, if that's a good idea. So there's no problem having things be free in a prior economy. You can do it. The trouble is, if doing it for some good makes it impossible to responsibly decide how much of that good to produce and how much of that good to consume. And that's true for lots of things, because it isn't just the good, it's the stuff that goes into producing the good, which is being used. So yes, you can make things free. And some things you certainly make free, like medicine and medical care, because nobody takes more of it than they need. Right? Of course not. And they do really need it. And so we produce it. So that's not a problem. Um, education. <clears throat> if you have a society like ours, in which some people are owners, then part of the educational system is a finishing school for them to learn how to comport themselves like masters of the universe. So Harvard and Oxford and Cambridge are finishing schools where they learn how to talk, how to sit, how to eat, and they, and they make friends with the other people with whom they're going to run the world. Okay. If you have a class of people in the middle, a coordinator class, and I don't call it a middle class, intentionally, that's what bourgeois you know, academics call it to obscure the fact that it has a basis. It's not just middle income, and it isn't even remotely middle income. The 20% I'm talking about you know, are not middle income by any means. They're way above middle income. Middle income is way down here among organized workers someplace. Um, but they're way up here. And that set of people, since it's gonna, they're going to be empowered, they get a reasonable education. When they're in high school and they look up at the clock, they want the day to continue because they're getting a rich experience, et cetera, et cetera. But 80% of us, when we look at the clock at the end of the day in high school, we're praying for the damn clock to get to the end so we can get out. And the reason we're doing that is because the school is teaching us to endure boredom and to take orders, to become part of the working class. 20% is becoming part of the coordinator class. 80% is smashed to hell. Just listen to John Lennon sing Working Class Hero. And, and that's... That's the educational system. So what happens in a paracon? Well, in a paracon, everybody is perfectly free and in position to utilize whatever talents and skills and interests they have. There's absolutely no cost, no harm to anybody else from anybody doing that. In our system, you have to keep people from becoming doctors so doctors can keep up the monopoly and the price and the, and the wage level that they have. And you keep people from becoming, you know, that's different. In this new approach, there's no, there's no reason for anybody to want anything other than each person who's going through a school system to get the fullest possible education, not to be blasted, but to be made of, you know, to have available the, 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 the mechanisms of expressing themselves and becoming a full person. So there's no tracking. There's no class system. That's the point. Um, so there's no examples of judgment. I'm sorry, what? No exams and judgments and teachers well, saying you know, you're if you're asking my opinion, that would be one thing. I can't give an answer to that. I don't know. My own opinion is that there are many kinds of exams and stuff like that are harmful. But there are some kinds that make sense. I don't want to fly on a plane with a pilot who has never been examined whether or not they can fly the plane. Right? So there are, there are standards. Standards are not capitalist, standards are standards, right? They can be done in a brutal, grotesque fashion. But they're absolutely necessary in a different way. It's the same with valuations. Valuations can be done the way they are now, which are brutal and grotesque, but they can be done differently by a different kind of allocation system. That's the point. Um, I guess that's... Oh, you, um, you mentioned the one 
country problem and the, and the international pressures problem. That's correct. So if there's parry found in one country, and the one country is, let's say, Venezuela, right? Let's say Venezuela becomes a parry con, a participatory society, or a participatory socialist, I also call it. Um, let's say it does that. What happens? Well, the biggest pressure they face is the possibility of invasion by the United States. And it's my responsibility, along with people like myself in the United States, to prevent that from happening. Um, and we sure will try, if you guess, even now. Um, the second possibility is, is that the international market says to Venezuela, exchange at market rates, function in a market manner. Now, it's very interesting. Right now, Venezuela is violating that. Right now, Venezuela is trading with other countries in Latin America, oil, for other goods, implicitly. They, they're, they're, they, that's the exchange that's happening. And the price of oil set by markets, and the price of those other goods set by markets, is such that when the exchange occurs, the bulk of the benefit would go to Venezuela because of the market pricing. But Venezuela says to Bolivia, you know what? That's crap. That's unjust. It's not right. That's a market price. We want to negotiate a just price. And they do. And they ignore the market. That's rather interesting. And inside Venezuela, there are many places where communities are cooperatively negotiating exchange. The community isn't going to the farms and taking everything that they want. That's just, it's just not real. But what they are doing is going to the farm and negotiating with the farmers and the community and not using competitive prices, but instead negotiating cooperatively exchange rates and prices. That's moving toward a participatory economy. Um, the, the practice of a paricon in a world, well, my, aside from defending itself, which won't be easy, um, especially if the movement in the United States isn't strong enough to help um, anyone. Uh, again, it, it, I think the right behavior, one only hopes that people would do it, countries would do it, is to exchange with other countries at the market price or at the paricon price, the cooperative exchange price, whichever one more benefits the poorer country so as to redistribute benefits. Right? That's, I think, the socialist way to behave. And that's the way that is starting to emerge in Latin America um, and ought to be talked about more because it's incredibly different from what anybody else in the world is doing and exemplary, I think. Why are you talking about Venezuela? I didn't hear anybody ask a question about Venezuela, but I would have thought that, that, that um, being an army officer and the army corps would be a you know, thing to be a <coughs> definition of a coordinated class. I'm sure was it Nick Kernel, was it General Simo Chavez, is it a member of your coordinated class? But anyway, let's get back to the, the questions that were asked. Now, about workers and consumers. Actually, to tell the truth, we don't think there'll be a working class, the workers in the socialist system of society. Because socialism will be a classless society. What the aim of the socialist movement is, is to abolish the working class as a class so we just have free men and women cooperating to produce what they need. But to come to the scarcity debate, it's true that a lot of oil and other resources are being used up under capitalism. But capitalism is a system of organized waste. I mean, the most obvious waste of capitalism is what we're debating this evening. The money system, buying and selling, monetary accounting, all that sort of thing. I mean, nobody down, in this, in, down that way towards a city does anything useful except for the people who are cleaning the toilets. They're all in, 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 involved in pushing pieces of paper around and things like that. So all that would be eliminated in a socialist system of society. And once again, the other great waste, of course, of, of capitalism is the waste of armaments and preparations for armaments, for, for war and actual wars themselves. Of course, we've just been told that there will be armies uh, and navies and air forces uh, under Paracon. But in a socialist society, all that would be eliminated, would, would be eliminated. So there'd be much, we could actually produce much more useful things, probably, using up less resources than uh, today, under capitalism, of course, also in a socialist system of society, planned that obsolescence will go up. Things will be made, and can be made, to last instead of to break down after five or ten years or so. Um, 
I'll just put a, a question to Michael for your answer in summing up. He says it there could be three things in the power government government. He doesn't seem very keen on it, and I'm not quite sure how this would be decided. I, I haven't heard any description of uh, any political institutions or some democratic central uh, decision-making body that, that, uh, that could make a decision. Like I think the logic of this system, if you go into detail, is that prices, prices uh, determine what should happen. And if you have something free, it will distort the price system. Now, coming to wants and needs, I've been accused of attributing views to Michael, which he doesn't hold. So I'll, I'll read three passages from him and one from one of his supporters. If something is of no cost and I want it, sure, I'll take it to enjoy it, why not? Tell everyone that they can have a free house, a really nice car or two, whatever equipment uh, they like for sports or hobbies, whatever TVs they want, uh, they would enjoy, other tools of daily life, whatever food they want, nightly, etc., etc., because it's all free. No problem for them to take what they want and see what happens. No one will behave, will, will conduct themselves responsibly. Since they can have product from the available social product regardless, so sloth is rewarded, likewise greed. Now this, this next quote isn't in fact. Flat um, from me. Those quotes are from me. But the, yeah. but the next one isn't. But uh, it's from the, the, it's, it's from the Baracon, uh, it's from the Baracon website. Under the money scheme, those with the least social consciousness or least sense of social responsibility will win out because they will be more aggressive in taking free items from distributing centers. Since there is no requirement for work, the free riders who do no work will burden the system to the point of collapse. Why then burden ourselves with the risky system of moneyless free access with its huge dangers of being dragged down by parasitic free riders? Now, this is the objection we get every day from supporters of capitalism, and it's, 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 it's got a logic. If you accept the basic principle of bourgeois economics, that there is scarce, economics is all about attributing scarce resources amongst competing demands, you have to end up with, with, with that sort of uh, objective. As I said, I think the basic paracon philosophy of human nature is that, that people are lazier than they are greedy. When it comes to education, once again a bit off, 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 off topic, but in socialism, uh, education will be free. So that's, that's the first thing. But uh, education under, under capitalism, what's it doing? It's turning out wage slaves and, I have to say, salary slaves. Because the people that you, most of the people you put in your coordinated class, are in fact members of, of the working class who have got a particular skill which they have to sell on the market for a wage or a salary, just like. The 80% of you. So we don't see any difference between most of your 20% and uh, the 80% which, 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 which you call working class. As far as we're concerned, 95% of the population are, are working class in the sense of being forced by economic necessity to go out and try to sell their ability to work for a wage uh, or a salary. You've got the top 2% of people who own, you've got some of these other people uh, at, the, at the top of nationalised industries and so on who managed to cream off some uh, uh, privileged income for themselves. But the basic division in human society is not 2, 20, 80, but that is 2, 1979. But the basic division in society is, is 96, 4%. That's, that's, that's as far as we're concerned. Okay, um, I'll take one more round of questions. Anybody else with a question? <coughs> yeah, this, um, um, uh, Paracon para uh, economics, whatever it's called, it sounds a bit like um, co-ops. Um, and you were talking earlier about people being rewarded for how long that they work harder, um, you know, work, work more hours, work harder, they get rewarded. But what about if you've got one, organi sort of one organisation making bicycles, as you said, with a, a young, fit workforce who are single, don't have families, can put in all the hours God sends, don't, you know, not worried about getting home late, how is that going to be fair to, you know, um, people with families, women with, you know, childcare issues? How's that? How can that be fair? Because then there's going to, it's going to create competition, isn't it? Any other questions? Just move back. Yeah, on the scarcity debate, um, I think also about how many people might want to work and how many people might want to consume. Then, was this the third factor of how much we want to consume from sort of the planet? 
And even if we say that um, this is a sort of problem that I want you to solve as a question, even if we say that huge amounts of oil, say, are being wasted by uh, capitalist waste, um, wouldn't it be the case that ideally we want to use no oil or no wood because forests can't really be, you know, basically you want really natural forests, you wouldn't want managed forests. So if we were really, really hardcore ecologists, which we might be, then we want to still limit our consumption even if we had great human nature. So how would that be solved? Anyone else? I've got one question. So you both are very good ideas. You both are very good ideas in how your society will work and so forth. But the society that we live in today is a very class society. It is a very systematic society. And these individuals, corporations, or whatever they might be, aren't just going to decide one day, okay, I give that up. Let's uh, try your way. It's very nice and jolly that we talk about these things, but the reality of it is is that this won't be given up without a fight. So how do you propose that we actually change this way of thinking to get it into place? Because it could be, like you said, from the 60s, we've been planning socialism. From the 70s, we've been doing, we could be talking about in 2040. We're still talking about it, but then nothing's ever changed because we still have these systems in place. How would we get rid of that? OK, there's uh, quite a lot of there. Um, that question, can you talk about the pieces as well? Okay, but would you like to talk about the police? Uh, it's well? in relation to what he was asking, uh, you know, like a, a control mechanism. Okay, okay on the um, question of ecology and the uh, and, 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 and the planet, obviously, in a socialist system of society, we're not going to um, exploit the planet. So, you know, maybe you're right. Oil shouldn't be being used. It should, you know, shouldn't, it shouldn't be being burned. Maybe it should be used as, as a raw material for plastics or something like that. The thing about the socialist system of society is because they're not these economic uh, pressures, we can make these decisions as conscious democratic decisions. We, we, we can decide, right? We, we, you know, for, for instance, uh, earlier, earlier on, you know, Michael said, "Ah, in in your system, there'll be no restrictions on." You know, no concern for the health of the people that, that are producing things. No concern. But of course, there'll be concern. That's, that's what it's all. It's all. It's, it's, it's all about. And we can do this because we will, for the first time in, in human history, be in control of what we produce. If you've got common ownership of the, uh, of, of the means of production and democratic control, I mean, are we going to decide that the people working uh, are going to work under 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 dangerous? Circumstance. Are we going to decide that we're going to overfish or overuse oil and so on and so forth? So, I mean, but I'll just draw this to your attention that under the Paracon system, the, the, the solution to, to, to the problem you're talking about is via the, the, the price mechanism. The, 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 the price of oil would rise to, to, you know, to such a level that um, people would use less of it. But of course, what happens under capitalism when that happens is as, as the price the oil goes up, so it becomes <laughs> profitable to try and get oil from under the, uh, 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 the North Sea and, and so on. And to ask the question about how the socialist system will come into being, that's not the topic of the discussion, but it's, a, it's, it's a legitimate question. We take the view that you cannot have a socialist system of society unless and until the majority of people want it and understand that the social system of society can only come into you democratically, you mean democratically, in two senses. First of all, it has majority support. And secondly, we're saying that in, in a country like Britain uh, and, and in America, once you've got a majority in favor of socialism, they can use the ballot box to gain control of political power and uh, abolish capitalism. So that's, that's, that's what we say. How you have to have a majority of people in favor of getting rid of capitalism, and they can organize, and they can use the ballot box to this. Of course, that's not the only thing they do. They have to organize themselves uh, at places of work, they have to organize themselves outside of Parliament, ready to implement socialism and keep production running uh, once capitalism has been formally abolished. As to the police, well, as the 
chairman said in his opening statement, in his introduction, we say that socialism is being not only moneyless, weightless, and classless, but also stateless. So we don't see a coercive state machine existing in a socialist system of society. I'm not saying there won't be any anti-social acts, but we don't see the need for a police force, an army, of course, or jails, and things like that. I think you'll find that when Michael answers this question, he will say, yes, there will be a police force. And one of the things we're going to have to do will be to try and stamp out the black market, which probably would, would develop under, under his system, just as it did in the former Soviet Union. So, anyway, so the answer to your question is that one would know that we don't envisage a police force of the sorts that exists today. Uh, I think the first question was about families uh, and multiple kids or children and uh, a different circumstance for the worker. Well, well aged very, even. Huh? I mean, a 20 year old boy can work harder than a 55 yeah. year old man. So. Yeah, except that it's, they're not working hard. It's, it's duration, intensity, and onerousness. So if I'm weak and spindly, he's really strong. He doesn't get more by virtue of being really strong, right? He doesn't get that. So that's one part. The other part is kids get an income. Everybody gets, so kids get an average income as if they were an adult working at an average level for an average period of time. So kids get an income. Maybe society decides kids only need a half an income. I have no idea, right? But whatever it is, that's what it is. So now it's equilibrated. Now, you know, I, I think that problem is dealt with in that manner. Of course, if the only way you can get an income is to work, all kids would die. So that's not what it's about. So that's uh, that one. The no oil one. I, this question is a little more subtle than I think. Um, uh, what does it mean to say no oil? Well, what it would mean to say is that the use of oil is worse than the non-use of oil. That's what it has to mean. In other words, we don't not do oil because of some, you know, oh, we feel oil is bad. You don't do oil because using oil is harmful, and it's more harmful than the benefits that come from using it. And the same for anything else. Right? Same for anything else. If, if there are benefits that far outweigh the costs, good. If there are costs that far outweigh the benefits, don't do it. And that's what you need a measure of. You say we should make that decision. Well, I agree. But we don't make that decision by having the government make it. We don't make that decision. We make that decision in a self-managed way because we have the information available that allows us to make that decision. That's the crucial thing. The word prices drives people up the wall. It's just a sort of a congealed representation of a careful assessment of all social, ecological, and personal costs and benefits. It allows us to make the decisions that you want us to cooperatively and, and um, self, in a self-managing way make. But without the information, you can't make those decisions. That's, I keep repeating, but I can't help it. Um, uh, police was another one. Uh -huh. All right, you're right. I think that it makes no sense to talk about no police anymore, no police function, any more than it makes sense to talk about no doctor function, or no airplane function, or no farmer function. Unless we think, unless we assume a can opener. <coughs> if we assume a can opener, that is to say, if we say nobody will ever get drunk and violent. Nobody will ever be pathologically violent. Socialism is utopian. Everybody functions nicely. And everybody, or if we think, when somebody is violent in that fashion, just any old person who happens to be nearby can handle it. Any old person can fly an airplane. Ridiculous. There's an airplane function. One has to learn it. Of all the functions in society, police is one of the functions policing in a positive way that's designed to serve the community and not to impose power, that's something you have to learn. You have to learn how to handle a drunk. You have to learn how to handle theft or violence. There's no problem with the black market. That's just one more thing attributed to me. You don't need a police to stop a black market. But what you do need a police for is to stop Hannibal Lecter. Now, if you want to tell me there's no such thing as Hannibal Lecter in world socialism when it arrives, then I agree with you. You don't need police to stop him because he doesn't exist. And if there's also no such thing as a drunk and no such thing as somebody who 
commits rape and no such thing as any of that, then you don't need any police. But if there are those things, then you need police. And you don't do it by empowering some group to kill us all. Of course not. You have people who like doctors and lawyers and bricklayers and ball players and everything else learn their trade, have a balanced job complex, get income for duration, intensity, and onerousness, cannot aggrandize themselves, cannot have more than self-managing power, but have a responsible job to do. So that's police. Um, I really mean the thing I said about assuming came over. If you assume world socialism, then you don't have to worry about differences between countries on the way. If you assume that, okay, we're going to get majority rule, when we have majority rule, we'll have an election, and when we have the election and the majority wins, we'll have socialism, then you don't have to deal with any other questions. If you assume that we can produce enough for everybody, and we can produce what people want, and that nobody will be greedy, because you call greedy wanting something that is said to be available and that you like. That's not greed. It's greedy to want something. This is the point I keep raising, and you're not answering it. It's greedy to want something irresponsibly, to want something that, that would preclude others from getting things. OK, that's greedy. We're greedy. But I don't know where it is. I don't know what's greedy. A hundred years ago, things that were greedy now are commonplace. Just five years ago, desires for computers that would have been greedy now are not greedy. The prices change. The ability to produce things change. What's greedy is a function of how we apportion our resources. Right? It changes the value of things. And we have to collectively decide how to do that. You can't just assume it's done. And you can't just assume that everybody is going to take you know, just housing, just food, and just clothing. Right? Even that, I don't think you can handle this way, because you don't know how much of it to make, and you don't know what quantity, and you don't know what quality, and so on and so forth. But how about bicycles? How about motor transportation? How about violins? How about computers? How about hairbrushes? How many pencils? How many pens? Too many pens, there won't be enough pencils. Too many pencils, there won't be enough pens. How much do people want these things? That matters. It, but it's, it's nowhere as near as we're, we're fixating on that. And honestly, I think the real issue here is the coordinator class issue. Because that's the one that's more important politically. And this gets to how you win. That's a long discussion, and I agree that we, that wasn't the topic. So that's partly why it's not being addressed. You right? um, can't do everything all the time. But this does bear on that. If we say that 96% of the society is working class and 4% of the society is capitalist, then we have one thing we have to do. We have to win a society that liberates 96%. And all 96% at least have it in their societally determined position and interest to pursue that once consciousness is raised. OK, fine. I wish it was the case, but it's not. It's not like that. There's this group that is in a different position right? from 80%. If you think a doctor and a steel worker, or a doctor and an assembler, or a doctor and somebody who's flipping hamburgers is the same thing fine, right? Then that's one position. I'm saying no. The doctor and the person who's making McDonald's hamburgers are not in the same class. Why aren't they in the same class? Because this one's conditions of work yield a level of confidence and social skills and access to power that this one do not. And that they are worlds apart. And I suggest you go ask either one of them if they're worlds apart you'll find that the working person dislikes this doctor more than they dislike capitalists. Because they've never encountered a capitalist. They've never felt it. Talk to them. They've never experienced it. But every day, they encounter doctors, lawyers, engineers. They're not the devils. But they treat workers like children. And they regard workers as dumb and as incapable. And as a result, there's a tension there, a class conflict. So we get to your question. If we create a movement, and we say to ourselves, we're creating a movement to, to win socialism. Not capitalism, socialism. But we have no conception of this class issue. Then in our movement, we don't pay any attention to this difference. And what we get is movements that are dominated by representatives of the coordinator class. We get movements that are led by 
whose tone and style and manner are dominated by that sector. And what happens is those movements become unappealing to working people. In fact, in the same way, a racist movement becomes unappealing to blacks in the US, or a sexist movement becomes unappealing to women. So we create a movement which, instead of having the seeds of the future and the present, which I know you want, says to workers, hey, the future is your worst nightmare. It's your doctor being the ruling class, a lawyer being the ruling class, right? And that's not the, that doesn't win because it doesn't attract and it won't hold working people. So that's a, that's a strategic implication. What we instead have to do is build movements that display and that, that develop consciousness and, and practice that is self-managing and that has balanced job complexes and all the rest of it, and that is trying to win. How does it win? Well, it creates workers' councils. We probably agree. It creates consumer councils it, in neighborhoods. It, um, it wins reforms, but it does it in a way which is trying to raise consciousness so that you will fight further, and then you will win more power and ultimately change society. Maybe it's electoral, as suggested. Venezuela is an example of that. Maybe it's not electoral. Maybe it's massive movements growing and growing, and then occupying factories more and more, and transforming society. I don't know. There's no one right answer. There's different contexts, different results. But clearly, or at least to me, it seems clear, one key thing about that process and about that effort is that if we ignore, obscure, deny, the class distinction between the coordinated class and the working class. Call it the middle class, or just call it part of the working class that happens to have more income, or anything else, right? That makes it not two classes below capitalists. If we do that, then what will happen is our movement will be dominated by that group. And it will be unappealing to working people. And if it wins, like every Marxist Leninist movement in the past, it will produce an economy. Forget the quality for a minute. That's horrendous. But it will produce an economy that elevates that coordinator class, the group that monopolizes in power and work to remain status. And we don't want that. We want classlessness. We have to pay attention to this. That's what that's what I want, I guess, my main message to be. The stuff about allocation, okay. The stuff about allocation, um, you know, that just takes more time. People have to think that through. Maybe he's right, maybe I'm right. Um, uh, the stuff about uh, class is a much more fundamental distinction. If, if, if that's, that's, that's a serious problem because it has strategic implications in that. Right? So. All right, um, uh, just, we, we've got about 10 minutes now. Uh, any comments from the floor? Anybody like to speak? Uh, here, then, uh, um, well, I mean, I'm supposed to start with now. I could uh, pick holes in an awful lot of what uh, Michael has said. It seems that uh, we're talking about responsibility, social responsibility. And it strikes me as that what Michael was doing with his paragon scheme is imposing responsibility by price. Now, to, to get an angle on responsibility, you've got to look at you know, where society's coming from. And to do that, take a look at history. Now, you can look at history in three ways. That was first simple. Second's a bit problematic, a bit more, more philosophical. First two, the more you know, the more you can do. Second, the better you know, the better you can do. And the third way to look at history is like a rite of passage, a coming of age. Now, when an individual comes of age, they become an adult. And as an adult, they should know who they are and what they want. And there's something else that comes along with being an adult. It's qualification. You take responsibility for children, because children cannot take responsibility for adults. Now, if we look at our world today, there's 40,000 children plus dying every day. But we want clean drinking water, some decent food, perhaps some shelter. All those things easily provide them. So, they're dying. So, therefore, we can look at our society and say that it's yet to come of age. It's yet to take responsibility for children. It's immature. Now, what socialism is, is a mature society. When we come to terms with who we are, we know who we are. Now, for me, I've studied a little bit of paleoarchaeology and some genetics. And I've discovered irrefutably that I'm a member of the human family. And 
who you believe yourself to be determines what you want. What I want is a family life. A life where, as in a family that functions, you bring a problem to your ability and you take according to your needs. Now, what this requires is a common interest born out of that common identity. Now, we're all capable of achieving this common identity, and the great thing about this is that when we have this common identity, we find it is impossible to coerce, exploit, oppress, to stitch up in any way those that we identify with. And my brother is obsessed with greed. Now, greed isn't a fundamental facet about human nature. Greed is merely a symptom of the society we live in. Greed is the fear of not having enough. We live in a society that's dominated by poverty. So therefore we try and get as much round as material goods or whatever to elevate ourselves out of poverty. And the further we elevate ourselves out of poverty, the farther it is to fall back down into it, the uglier it becomes so the more and more we want. Now if we have a society, society of common ownership, democratic control, where we produce our needs, then that fear disappears. And when I ask the question to this audience, well, what do we really need? What I need is good food, good clothing, shelter, medicine, education, art, music, dance, sport, literature. And that's not being greedy. And we can all produce that for ourselves. If we really move the scarcity in capitalism, then greed ceases to exist. So, I don't know where his objective is coming from. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's basically, it's, it's an argument that, you know, it is, it is, his argument against socialism boils down to basically human nature. And what, it's, what it re re refers to human nature is human behaviour and capitalism, a competitive society. In a cooperative society, free money exists. And as I said before, you can't stitch up, abuse, exploit, or oppress people you identify with. Yeah, um, I just wanted to address to Michael about um, how you, you actually measure hard work again. I thought, I thought the lady here. Uh, you respond. I don't, I don't think you responded to her concerns uh, quite fully there. I think she made some really interesting things about uh, the, the differences. It's, it's almost like a meritocracy. It's, it's, it's a different kind of rulership, the rulership of the hard work. Or something. And I, I don't understand um, quite how you're organizing this hard work principle. So I, I think you need a bit more explanation on it. Okay, any more comments? Anybody like to speak? Yeah? Sure. Sorry, please. Yeah, please go ahead. There seems to be a lot of research that um, is that, that with, uh, I don't know, increased wealth is decreased happiness. Um, there's a lot of support that, like, um, that a lot of uh, unhappiness in society is caused by money. So it just seems that uh, the logical situation would just be to eliminate the money altogether. We're coming towards the close of the debate. So if Michael wants to respond to it, I'll ask him to do it in his closing remarks. Yeah? Okay, any other comments, please? Anyone want to make a contribution? Uh, hang on, uh, let, let's, uh, let's just let this. Very brief. Um, well, let's just see. Um, I want to make sure there's nobody else who's just sort of hovering to put their hand up. But, okay. Ready? Nobody else? Okay, just very well, briefly. What I failed to say is that what I think we need in society today is a social relationship that's in accord with our biological relationship. That's what we need. And as a member of the human as we're all members of the human family, we should have a family relationship to see one another as we really are. Because that is our true basis as human beings, members of the same family. Okay. Do I take it that uh, you're all done there? Last jump? Okay, that's fine. Um, because the, uh, the speakers have um, uh, had quite a lot of time to talk during the, uh, uh, during the session, uh, the question now, so they've agreed to wind up five minutes. So um, I'll ask uh, Michael now just to make his closing remark. Right, I'm just going to respond to the, the points that were raised, since they were raised and should be responded to, I guess. Um, human nature. First of all, I probably spend as much of my time as anybody who's here in the party spends of their time 
responding to people saying human nature sucks, humans are greedy, humans are this, humans are that, therefore paragon is impossible. Um, I do that all the time. But when somebody talks to me, I don't assume that what they're saying is exactly what everybody else talks to me is saying. I have not once said human nature is greedy. I have said it is not greedy to desire something that would make your life better if you don't know that consuming it would hurt somebody else. Now, if you listen to that and hear that and hear and respond to it, I, I'd love to hear the response. But if 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 it's the case that a, you know a, a Stradivarius don't cost no more to produce than a toothbrush, then we all want one. <coughs> but if it costs a ton to produce, it use a lot of oil, right, or whatever then we don't want it, because it would be irresponsible. So, or we don't take it, we don't, we, we want to be responsible. We need measures by which we can be responsible. So, greed, I agree with you, I, I mean, I can tell you all the ways that I argue against human nature's greedy, human nature precludes balanced job complexes, human nature precludes participation, human nature precludes not having leaders, blah, blah, blah. All the time we do that. Um, it's very ironic to, for the first time, have it um, hard work. Um, well, first of all, we work at, this is a workplace. So we work in a workplace. We have balanced job complexes. So that means we've divided up the work so we all have a mix of, of work. And it's comparably empowering. Now, how long do we work? Well, first of all, it has to be part of the work process. So you, you can't just all of a sudden decide to work two hours, then the people you're working with can't work. So we collectively are agreeing on, okay, the work day is whatever it is, probably about four or five hours, you know, maybe the work week is 20 hours, 15 hours, I don't know, because indeed we get rid of a whole lot of waste. We don't produce for advertising, we don't produce all sorts of stuff. Okay, agreed. So what about intensity? Well, it might be the case that I want to work really hard because I want a little more, right? I want, I want something more. But somebody else would rather work less hard and have a little less. That's a trade-off. Or I want to work a little longer because I want something that's, that, that requires more, that, that, you know, that embodies more social cause. So I work a little longer because I want to get it. Or I work a little less long because I'd like more leisure. Those are responsible choices. So hard work is measured by who? Workers' council. What's everything else measured by? Workers' council. Where are the decisions made? Workers' council. It's the answer for everything. See, but, I, hmm? I, I bet it's, it's such an abstract Things. Well, it's this is work. a quick presentation. We talk about time, I mean, but I mean, let's kick it. Just that it's a quick presentation. I agree with you. Nobody should buy this, right? Nobody should believe. But maybe look at it a little more in some, you know, in its formulation. The next one was uh, eliminate money. Well, this is just back to, you know, I'm trying to think of an analogy uh, that, that that was, that, that, you know, eliminate capital. Yes. Eliminate profit making, yes. Eliminate class, yes. Eliminate valuations? No, that makes no sense. In other words, or look, there are anarchists right now who say the following. Workplaces spew pollution. Workplaces have wage slavery. Workplaces are oppressive, are oppressive environments. Let's eliminate workplaces. Right? I kid you not. Lots. They say that. Let's just do away with workplaces. We shouldn't have any of it. We shouldn't have any industry. We shouldn't have any of that. Cool, Instead of people, people say that. So it's, let's say somebody says that. What's the response? Well, the response would be, wait a minute. Let's get rid of all the bad attributes, and let's only do these things when the benefits outweigh the, the debits. Right? That makes sense to me. But a sort of a blanket decision a priori makes no sense. Some Greens say, small is beautiful. Everything should be small. It's ridiculous. Some things should be small. Some things should be large. You don't a priori decide the answer. You look at the situation and you weigh off the situation and you make a decision. Because sometimes large is more ecologically sound than small. And if we want to talk about that, we can. But it is sometimes. Um, less than, um, I, I, the coordinator, com I think the last comment I heard that was raising a point was this statement that the coordinator class also suffers, um, particularly in this society. Um, it's true, but it's a very different kind of suffering. 
It's a different situation. And if you don't think it's different, then you probably want to flip hamburgers instead of being in the coordinator class. And I bet you don't. And I bet nobody here does. And I bet nobody here would even think about it as a possibility because we all know damn well that the life situation of somebody who is, you know, up in this 20% is vastly better than the life situation of somebody in this 80%. Quite different. Are there problems? Yes. Serious problems. Law firm lawyers in law firms who are partners, $400 an hour partners, may have to work 80 hours a week. Why? Because if their firm doesn't make enough surplus profit, doesn't make enough profit, it can't buy rugs, it can't buy an airplane to take around clients, and it can't buy pictures to put on the wall. It needs those things. Why? Because if it doesn't have those things, it loses clients. And then it goes out of business. So those fancy lawyers have a choice, 80 hours or unemployment. So they choose 80 hours. And they don't like it, right? They, they, they got a shitload of money but they don't like that they don't have much of a life. I agree with you. But see, the interesting thing is, in a coordinatorist economy, in a market socialist economy, in a market socialist economy, it would be similar. In a, in a centrally planned coordinatorist economy, they can get rid of those problems for themselves. They can actually get rid of a lot of the pain that they suffer under capital and retain their advantage over workers. That's the problem. It's an ideology which advances their interests, and they suffer under capital by getting rid of capital. But it doesn't elevate workers. It keeps them on top. That's the logic. So I think um, some fundamental differences have emerged in the debate this evening. One is this last issue of uh, the coordinated class. I mean, Michael is saying that 20% of the population fall into this class, and he talks about high-flying lawyers and doctors in, in private practice, but 20% is not of the population. I mean, he's a one in five in this room. You could be a teacher, you could be a foreman, you, you could be a junior manager, so according to him, you're not in the working class. Now, we don't accept that, 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 that definition. We think that society is divided into two classes, those who own and control the means of production, and the rest of us who have to work for them for a wage or a salary. It's true that there are people quite highly paid, but they're not free agents. They're acting under the authority and for the benefit of those who own and control the, the, the means of production. Now, we can agree with them to, uh, to a certain extent that Marxist Leninism, in inverted commas, is the ideology of a would-be new ruling class. The whole theory of the, uh, of the vanguard party, of the workers need, 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 need leaders, and this vanguard gets into um, power and then becomes the new ruling class. We've seen this happen in a number of places. Now, I would still say that probably seen it happen in Venezuela, because we saw it happen in uh, China and in Russia. So I mean, that's, that's, that's one dispute. But it's not, I don't think, the, the fundamental dispute. You, you could have his class analysis and still want a moneyless socialist society. The basic thing is this, it's a factual thing. Can the world produce enough food, clothing, shelter, and other amenities of life to adequately feed, clothe, and shelter the whole world's population? Is there enough resource? Have we got enough resources to eliminate world poverty, to, to, to eliminate you know, world ignorance and world ill health? I think the answer is yes. There'll be study after study by the Food and Agriculture Organization, by the World Health Organization, and by other people. This scarcity has been conquered. We can't have a world of abundance. Okay, a world abundance is out of fashion now because of the green issue. Okay, let's have a world of plenty. We can produce enough for everybody. And we say that this can be done if and as soon as the resources of the world the earth, have become the common heritage of all. Once we can do this, we can produce enough that we just um, allow people to have free access and, and, and free distribution, but no, uh, no rational. And I think that is, in fact, a fundamental difference. Reichel wants to retain some system of rationing by, not by money. He, he doesn't stand for um, a moneyless society, he, he does stand for a, for a, for a cashless society, so you have to have cars like this where you could have access to food. So I mean, life in Paracon won't be all that different from life today. You'd, you'd go to work, you'd have to work 
how do you be really, um, uh, judged by your fellow workers as to how hard you work? And you get at the, at the end some credits which you have to use to, uh, to buy things. The enterprise in which you worked would still have to be subject to, to, to pressure to have this high, as possible um, benefit cost ratio measured in, in monetary terms. So I think the fundamental difference can be seen, uh, because what we're saying is that in a socialist society, there will be, will break the link between work and consumption. In Paracom, that is being, that, that link is being maintained. And so once we you know, retain the ration, because it doesn't think that if you didn't have this, enough people would work, or would work hard enough to produce enough of the things which people want. Now we, well, that is, a, that is an assumption about human nature. We don't, you know, we don't accept that. We can produce it. We have the time. There is anthropological and sociological studies, which which shows what you know, motivates people to, to you know to, to work uh, and so on. And um, well, before I sit down, just one more question about that. When you were speaking at the anarchist forum and you decided the need, the, the need for a police force, what sort of reaction did you get? We can discuss that afterwards. Uh, Anyway, so what we're advocating is, as I said before, world socialism, where the resources of the world will be only common by all the people, and we we'll use them to produce and distribute wealth in accordance with the principle from each according to their ability to each according to their needs. Before I wind up the, uh, the meeting entirely, thank, uh, thank you very much for a collection of £69.08. And uh, I will remind you that uh, Michael has some books for sale on the back there. There is some social literature also for uh, 2005. Um, thank you very much.